Meantime, here at home, the former Prime Minister Paul Keating has criticised certain media outlets for overplaying the threat of war with China. Joining us live with analysis is James Curran, a Professor of Modern History at Sydney University. James, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. In particular, the former PM was targeting a series of front page articles we've seen this week in Fairfax Papers. Is it accurate analysis in your view to warn of war with China within as early as three years or is that just plain fear mongering? I think there's a lot of fear mongering going on here, Ashley. I mean, it was only a matter of years ago that one of the um, experts that's involved in this uh, series for the Fairfax Press was warning of war in months. I mean, I think the key question here is what what does this group of experts know that uh, most of Western intelligence agencies do not? I mean, there's all sorts of time frames that are being put around uh, in recent uh, months. We've had the Pentagon, one of the Pentagon chiefs talk about war within two years. Look, I mean, any any prudent Australian government, of course, has to prepare for the worst. I mean, it is the first responsibility of government is to defend its people and and this continent, uh, Australia. But um, you know, there's a bipartisan consensus now on the AUKUS agreement. Uh, the Albanese government is about to bring down the Defence Strategic Review. I mean, the kind of preparedness that this group is calling for can't be manufactured overnight. So I think I think there's quite a bit of analytical rat baggery that's going on actually in the sorts of reporting that's that's coming through Fairfax at the moment in, in this series. So James, do you believe there is actually an appetite for war coming from China, from President Xi? Oh, well, look, I mean, some of the rhetoric from President Xi, I mean, there is every reason to be to have legitimate concerns about the kind of sabre rattling that is coming out from China. I think we're seeing belligerence on both sides of the Pacific being emboldened at the moment. Certainly we saw that in the aftermath of Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Uh, we may well see it again if the House uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy uh, uh, follows Pelosi to Taipei. Um, there's every reason to be worried about the flexing of the strategic muscle in China uh, and, the, as I say, the sabre rattling of Chinese nationalism. Uh, now, whether or not that means you draw a straight line, however, uh, as this expert commentary seems to do in the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, whether you draw a straight line from from Kyiv and the Ukraine to what Xi might do on Taiwan imminently, I think is a bit far-fetched. As I say, what does this group of experts know that most of the Western intelligence community does not? Uh, as I say, it is, of course, prudent to prepare for the worst, but we're having this kind of talk of Armageddon with all the visual imagery from the late 19th century uh, that frankly, frankly makes some of the Cold War imagery um, look rather quaint. I mean, to, I think to drum this up, to leave out entirely the sort of the place for diplomacy and statecraft um, and to really ramp up this rhetoric again at a time when, you know, if Australia has the leverage in Washington that it claims, then it should be talking to the Americans that, and indeed the Chinese about re-erecting the guardrails so that we don't get on this slippery slope to conflict. I mean, there's a, there is a responsibility here, I think, that commentators and analysts have um, not, to, not to sort of pump prime um, these old invasion sort of scare novel type literature uh, and, and, and actually sort of build the chorus of voices along the road to war. I mean, this is very similar to what, what we saw in World War II, um, where a group of voices in Australia sort of almost egged on, in many ways, the Japanese. Well, and we know where that led to. You mentioned Chinese nationalism. How has the intensity of that changed in recent times? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that Xi Jinping is the most forward-leaning Chinese leader we've seen, uh, especially in terms of the foreign policy posture, not only in the South China Sea, but, of course, in some of the uh, exercises that have been taking place around Taiwan and, of course, in the in the reaction that we saw to the Pelosi visit, as I said, last year. Look, Xi has not rethought any of his strategic picture uh, in the last 10 years. Um, you know, uh, I think it's very clear that he sees the Chinese model uh, of modernisation as now supreme to that of the West. I mean, this is his language that he's using. He's now saying that developing countries should look to China. You know, th this is the big question for strategic analysts: is how does these, how do these two nationalisms, that is, an American nationalism that is clearly feeling itself under pressure to retain its primacy in Asia, how does that play out? Right, and what do we what do we what do we get from a Republican potential Republican president in 2024, and how does Chinese exceptionalism play out? So there are some more sanguine analysts. The former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has said, 
We should be helping Washington, uh, as I said earlier, re-erect the guardrails so that so that this kind of belligerence is 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 calmed as much as possible but but yeah sure there are legitimate reasons to be worried about the the course and manifestation of of chinese nationalism but you know i think i think what really is getting under the skin of, of these uh, so-called experts that fairfax brought together is the fact that the albanese government through the efforts of penny wong and, and the prime minister have stabilized relations with china now labor is not talking about some kind of return to the sunlit uplands of the, the period before 2013. Uh, they're being very realistic about it. Um, but what I think gets under the skin of these kinds of experts is they think stabilisation is tantamount to appeasement. So, so they're bringing back every kind of old epithet and slogan under the sun to try and derail, I think, what is set fairly clearly here is the government's posture of stabilising the relationship. Hmm. And if you look back at the recent history, I mean, as you were alluding to there, things have disintegrated since that, I think you mentioned 2013 a, a, as a bit of a turning point. A lot of Australians probably reading those front page stories would be scratching their heads and thinking, well, how have we come to this juncture? What do you hmm. see as the key turning points in the past decade that really led to that relationship deteriorating between China, the US and, and allies like Australia? Oh, well, I mean, I think undoubtedly the key turning point is, is the sort of, as I say, the more forward-leaning uh, posture of Xi, the confidence in the Chinese system following the global financial crisis, uh, the preparedness of Xi Jinping to, um, I think, express China's international personality on the world stage in the way that he's doing. Um, that's clearly the turning point. And, uh, and obviously, I think the resurrection in Washington of uh, this language about a new Cold War. I mean, once you have, you've got a bias, very strong bipartisan consensus in Washington, uh, that this is a kind of an actual existential threat to American primacy in the region to its global hegemony. Uh, so I think those two forces coming together um, you know, have really sort of injected this kind of turning point. But uh, I also would just say that in terms of the reports in the Fairfax press over the last couple of days, I mean, the idea that somehow the Australian community is unprepared for this, I mean, beggars belief. We've had six years with Peter Harcher, in particular, the Sydney Morning Herald, or Clive Hamilton. We've had six years of red flags being waved, silent invasions being envisaged. Uh, we've had a very vigorous uh, and sometimes toxic debate in this country about the kind of challenge that China poses, which has had no shortage of kind of alarmism and at times, frankly, certain a certain amount of hysteria. The idea that, that, that the Australian public is somehow unprepared, um, you know, I just find just extraordinary. And where is the argument from these experts about Australian resilience? The Chinese policy of economic coercion backfired because the vast bulk of Australian exporters were able to diversify. Where is the argument here about Australian resilience? Where is the confidence in the democratic robustness of the, uh, the, the, the uh, of Australia? You know, we have a legitimate debate about foreign interference. That needs to be watched. But, you know, so far I have not seen one piece of legislation changed in any of the federal or state parliaments around this country. So I think a little bit of realism might need to be not might need to be sort of in, introduced here. What what we've seen over the past couple of days is the crudest kind of realism in the Fairfax press, which ironically brings on seeks to bring on the very circumstances which those experts so earnestly profess to want to avert. I think that's the real problem with it. Professor James Curran, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing a lot more about some of those issues as the Prime Minister walks the world stage over the next week and a bit. Really appreciate your analysis with us today. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks, Ashley.